Thank you for joining us today for our virtual Rote Scholars program. You have a treat waiting for you. Way down in Alabama, finding old time fiddlers and their tunes. Uh, you're going to have an opportunity to meet Mr. and Mrs. Coffin. Uh, they're going to help us explore the roots of the fiddle in Alabama with um, Ms. Cawthon and her husband, who will take you on a musical and historical journey to the early days of fiddling. It's a virtual Rhodes Scholars presentation that you are going to tell your friends about. Mr. and Mrs. Cawthon, please take it away. All right. Um, well, when Jim gets here, he'll push all the right buttons and we, <laughs> you will see a presentation we've prepared for you and then we will come back and join you for questions and answers. I can't right. wait. Are we ready? Okay, here we go. Well, thank you, Melanie, for that introduction. Uh, you've done just a really outstanding job and worked really hard putting on these virtual road scholar talks. I think it's really worth the effort. Um, you see in this photo next to me, um, my husband, Jim and I and a fiddler named Everest Campbell were sitting on the porch of the uh, general store at the Pike County uh, Pioneer Museum in about 1986 or something like that. And um, I'll just tell you what, what got us there and many other places in the state. Um, Jim and I had been attending um, in the 70s, mid 70s, had been attending bluegrass festivals and enjoying them. But suddenly some college students showed up, you know, from Eastern colleges and they were uh, playing something called old time music that we had not really heard before. And uh, it was so authentic sounding and so much fun, so spirited. And we liked their attitude about the music. And we just really got attracted to it. So Jim decided he wanted to play the fiddle. And eventually I came around and said, well, I'll, I'll play guitar beside you. Um, so when he started playing the fiddle, well, I naturally thought, well, we need to find some older fiddlers to teach you that style of music. And, uh, but we couldn't really find anybody. And I'm surprised that we started thinking, well, maybe Alabama didn't have a, a fiddle tradition. Maybe they just all sang hymns all the time or something. They didn't have, have fiddlers. Um, but I kept thinking about it and reading and all that sort of thing. And about 10 years after he started playing, um, finally it was a situation in our lives where I could start doing the research. And it, easily I found that there was a um, wonderful fiddle tradition in Alabama. That it, there was a time when everybody, it seems like, or every neighborhood had at least one fiddler in it. And so I wanted to document that. And so in the course of doing that, we met so many great men, ma mainly men, a few women, uh, who had played fiddle in the earlier days. And they played what we call old time music. And, and the difference between old time music and bluegrass is old time music's just pretty tune oriented. You play the tune and then you finish it, you play another tune, you don't do a lot of variations on it or stylistic um, beautifications of it. You don't um, improvise. You just play the tune and then you play another tune and you can do that all night long because fiddlers really pride themselves on how many tunes they know and can play a long time. Uh, it's older music is kind of a community music where it's accessible. It's not all that hard, really. And so people can get together and have fun playing music. And that's kind of what it's about, playing with your friends and playing for dances. It's an excellent kind of dance and music for square dances. Um, so when we first started learning music, um, we had to rely on uh, recordings from fiddlers in Tennessee and Georgia and North Carolina, West Virginia. Uh, so it was really good to get out on the road and meet these people and, and learn Alabama tunes. And so that was our mission. I'm going to, we're going to introduce you to four of the people that we really enjoyed meeting. But before that, I want to go a little into the history behind fiddling in Alabama. 
The American colonies were settled at a time when violins were becoming the rage in Europe. And I'm using the terms violin and fiddle interchangeably because they're really the same instrument. At this time, there was um, excitement about the rise and the numerous violin making workshops in the late 1500s in Cremona, Italy. Uh, luthiers such as Amati and Stradivarius and Cornarius and their families were making violins in large numbers. Uh, soon luthiers in France and England began supplying violins as well. And people who wanted violins but couldn't get them uh, had to rely on their own resources. Fiddles became popular with street musicians and the aristocracy, both, and they were especially popular in the British Isles. One English immigrant uh, to the colonies was John Utey, who entertained passengers on their voyage over to Jamestown, where he was documented as a fiddler in 1619. This was also the year that the first enslaved African people arrived in Jamestown as well. And we'll, we'll see that they had a strong impact on the way the fiddle was played in, the, in America. The fiddle became so popular because its superiority as a dance instrument. Dancing was a major part of social life in the colonies and in the early statehood. And the um, people of the aristocratic classes and the working classes uh, all partook in it in one way or another. Uh, I guess the fiddle was important in that regard because it was very portable and much more so than a keyboard. And uh, it, um, its high voice carried very well in a day when there was no other kind of amplification. Uh, so most of the founding fathers were active dancers and Thomas Jefferson loved to dance and he also was a fiddler. And I was reading his letters uh, big collection of letters and one of them I was talking to a friend who was about to go to Italy and he said well be sure and bring me back one of those good fiddles. Uh, as populations grew people from many ethnic groups uh, took up the fiddle and they played it in ways that were pleasing to themselves and their audiences. Uh, they, they would take these Irish and Scottish and English tunes that were popular for dancing and put play them with their own accents, with the stylistic techniques that they had previously been accustomed to. Um, for instance, it may be surprising to you, it was to me, uh, that, that uh, Cherokees played or Native Americans played in Alabama. We have um, a journal from a man named John Norton, who um, his father was brought to England from a Cherokee village in, in Tennessee that had been destroyed. So he had been raised in England and when he became an adult, he wanted to see what his father's culture had been like. So he came south, he went to Tennessee and then he came down into Alabama. And on the Tennessee River, uh, I assume near, uh, it was near Florence, uh, he visited a Cherokee village and they demonstrated first out on the greens. Uh, they, they did their native dances. And then they went inside the, a, a large structure and they did English country dancing and they had fiddles. And the fiddlers, Mr. John Norton didn't think they were great fiddlers, but I imagine they were playing what those young people wanted to dance to with a lot of rhythm such the rhythms they were accustomed to in their native dancing. And, um, but one group in particular made huge contributions to old time uh, music, and that's African Americans. And they were mainly enslaved in the South. And they played at the command and pleasure of those who enslaved them. And they played for those who lived in the slave quarters. And they may have played differently in each. Some learned the reels and gavots and shottishes for ballroom dances uh, that were led by dance masters. But they could also play kind of a breakdown music um, in the quarters for their friends who um, wanted to dance in a different style. You know, if that with an African heritage, you would tend to want more of a beat to your music because you were used to the, the drum beats. And so, um, 
I think they preferred and reacted and responded happily to music that was less melody and more rhythm and the fiddlers obliged them. And in so doing, they developed a style that we call Southern old time music, which is very popular. And part of that special thing about um, Southern old time music is the banjo. And the banjo was here as long as the fiddle and it came from Africa uh, through the Caribbean. And I think that the people brought from the Caribbean um, brought the banjo here and it made a, a big contribution. It, it's a rhythm instrument, but it's also a melody instrument and it sounds really good with the fiddle. So they created a style that, um, that, that white people wanted to imitate. They would come to, to listen to them in the slave quarters and they would um, want to learn to do that and play like them. And a man who has lived on plantation and he observed um, their, the holidays of uh, the enslaved people said that uh, white men, sons of the overseers or neighbor, neighboring people learn from them to play, but none could imitate them successfully. Um, well, for several reasons, blacks eventually left this style of music behind. They went on and developed other other styles. And so by the 1970s, when young people were going out for searching for old fiddlers, there weren't a lot of black fiddlers left. And there, there were none by the time I was doing my work. Um, you know, they hadn't been replaced. The music had been not so popular among African Americans and um, young people hadn't stepped up and, and kept it going. Uh, but fortunately, it didn't die out. And so I'm about to invite my husband here and uh, we'll play some of the tunes we learned from fiddlers who kept it going. Okay, as you can see, we're about to do some music. I want to bring Jim in. So he's my partner in, in crime here. Oh. And uh, he went with me. I would do mainly like the footwork, finding these fiddlers up through uh, publications and calling people and all that kind of stuff. And then he would join us on the weekends when we would go see people and record them. And uh, w one of the first places we went, as you see, was um, Pinson, Alabama. That's in Jefferson County, the same county that, that we're in, in Birmingham. And um, it was uh, most of the people we we interviewed lived far away from us. It was hard, but with the man Dad Hill that we had knew in Pinson, it was an easy trip, and we got to go a lot. And he knew a lot of great tunes. But before we play any, or before I tell you about him, I was thinking, as I was preparing this speech, that the lives that these fiddlers lived in the like 1920s and 30s was a lot like the life we're living right now during the the virus they they had to stay home most of the time uh, they didn't have any kind of entertainment you know they they it was very hard for them to go to any kind of concerts or anything they might go to church but they during the week they didn't see a lot of people so in those situations one of the best ways to have fun and entertain yourself was to play music with your family so all the fiddlers that we met uh, played with their families. They had brothers and sisters and uncles and aunts who would get together and play a lot. They played for dances, but mainly they just played to have fun and have something to do at night. So let's um, talk about Dad Hill. So Thomas E. Hill, nicknamed Dad, always called Dad his whole life, was born into a, a family of fiddlers. He said as long as anybody could remember, there had been fiddlers in the family. And he taught himself to play the way that, that most fiddlers did in, the, in those days. Um, I, each fiddler I met, almost every one of them, told me the story of their father saying, don't touch my fiddle. And of course, them touching the fiddle and picking it up and playing it and then being caught. And so Dad Hill's story is that when he was about eight years old, his job was to tend these little uh, baby twin brothers uh, while the rest of the family was working uh, in the fields. And so they were on a pallet and he was supposed to get them to sleep and everything. And his father had uh, hung his fiddle up on the wall 
of the porch. Not real wise, probably, <laughs> but he said, now don't touch my fiddle. And so uh, Dad Hill, of course, as soon as the babies got settled in, he takes the fiddle down and he starts playing. He said, um, I sneaked it down and went to making little sounds on it. Uh, finally, some of his old tunes, I learned to play some of them without any teacher. He came to the house one day after a drink of water and heard that fiddle and caught me and like to scared me to death. But his dad said, go ahead, play me a tune. And when he played the tune, the father was pleased. And then he was invited to the circle of musicians in his family and he could play. Um, like most fiddlers that I had met at this time, he had stopped playing for 20 years at least. And uh, there was this period where fiddling kind of went underground or almost died. And it, uh, when I asked what happened, most of them would say, um, well, I had a family to raise. But it was really other circumstances, I think. One was, that was Elvis Presley. That, that some of them would blame it. It was Elvis Presley. We'd blame it on Elvis. But others, um, you know, didn't recognize that. But it, I think it's true that people really got into Elvis Presley, people of, um, who like country music, people who like blues, who like any kind of music, uh, city people, country people liked it. And so when they went to have community gatherings, instead of hiring a fiddle band and having a square dance, they would hire a band that could play Elvis Presley music. It really sounds bad on a fiddle, I'll, I'll tell you that. <laughs> and so, um, they just kind of lost those kind of gigs. And another thing that happened was square dancing was a very big thing during the 50s, but they had decided that it was easier to call and much cheaper to call to recordings than to a live band. So the, the fiddlers lost that big gig. So they didn't really have a lot of to play except at home. Some of them did, but others just decided to put their fiddles away. But by the time he had been playing for a few years and he had made, um, a lot of, of musical friends and, and was having a time with his music again. And um, so one of the tunes he played, he knew, he's one of these fillers who, who knew hundreds of tunes. Uh, one of them he played was called Climbing the Golden Stairs. He said, I don't think there was a time my father got out his from the case that he didn't play this tune. And we really like it and can see why. Okay, one, two, three. place to look for old time music would be Sand Mountain. And there we found several really good fiddlers. And um, it, it's because Sand Mountain is known for its traditional music. When folks stopped fiddling elsewhere, they still fiddled on Sand Mountain. And we have recordings of a band, the Johnson Family Band from Albertville, actually Hustleville, Alabama, who were playing on the radio in the 1950s. And uh, they would play on the radio and then they'd uh, haul off in their car and go to the National Guard Armory and play for dances. And that was still going on when rock and roll had mainly taken over the airways other places. And Sand Mountain is also known 
uh, around the world for Sacred Heart singing. Jim's got a Sacred Heart book here. You know what that is? Uh, it's shape note singing, four part a cappella, and it's written with all four parts for every line of the music. And the people sing the shapes, the notes, they say fa, so, la, instead of the words as they sing it the first time, and then they sing the words. Okay, so um, we, we came across one fiddler who did both fiddling and sacred harp singing. Noah Lacey of Eider was a, a fine gentleman, a kind and very talented fiddler and sacred harp singer. His father and his uncle and his older brothers were all fiddlers and he taught himself to play when he was 15. Uh, his story is pretty much like Dad Hill's about playing in the closet and then being discovered and being invited to join the circle. Uh, fiddles and banjos were the main instruments in, uh, among country people. They, they didn't use guitars until about the 1920s. And the first guitar that uh, Noah Lacey ever heard was on the telephone. And that's because they had party lines. And there was one band, one family band that would put out a notice to everybody that they were gonna be playing on the party line at two o'clock on Sunday afternoon and people could pick it up and listen. And so that's what they did. And that's where he heard a strange instrument that he had known. Now they had probably heard of guitars, but guitars were not played with fiddles and banjos until about that time somebody got the idea of, well, we could just be playing chords along with this melody. We don't have to be playing these fancy fandangos and things that, that people used to play. Um, so anyway, he was, uh, his first paid gig was on a, um, what they call the Flying Jenny. And it's a merry-go-round that was powered by a mule. The people would sit on this big uh, revolving platform that had chairs on it. And, and it was t attached with gears to um, a donk, a mule. And the mule would go around this way and the uh, people would go around that way. And the musicians would stand in the center and play. And then when they got a new load of people, the man who was running it would put a nickel in the pocket of each of the uh, the players. And so they actually made some money. And when they were, they were teenagers playing on the Flying Jenny. And he also played for fiddlers conventions and square dances. They had a lot of uh, those things on Sand Mountain. He was a sawyer by profession and he continued to do it even when we um, met him when he was 79 years old. He was out working in a sawmill. Uh, well, in the, as I said, in the 50s, a lot of people didn't, they stopped playing, but he didn't. He had the son, Chester, who was a very good guitar player, and they would play a little every day. And uh, so he was still in fine form when we met him. Noah and his wife Marjorie were passionate about sacred harp singing, and, he, and Noah could hardly talk about it without tears in his eyes because there were so many family memories uh, involved with going to Sacred Harp sayings. And one of his favorite Sacred Harp songs was Marilla's Lesson. Um, the melody um, came from an old Fife march and uh, someone had added words to it. And uh, he liked to play it as did many fiddlers. So it, we ran across many fiddlers who played it. Um, and it, just because it's such a lively tune. Now, they would play the melody, which in Sacred Harp is the tenor part, um, but we decided since there were two melody instruments in this little group that uh, maybe I could do the treble part. So the second time we play it, we'll add the, a harmony part to it. So it's here's Marilla's lesson. One, two, Thank you. 
So now we're driving down to uh, Pike County, and um, we ended up there in a very, I guess, serendipitous way, or at least fortuitous way. Uh, what happened is that um, we had an interview in Andalusia, and somehow we hadn't planned what we are going to do after that. And so we found ourselves late on Saturday night, not having a full day left tomorrow, but not knowing what we were going to do with it. So I suggest that we go to Troy and stay in a motel, and the next go, day go to the Pike County uh, Pioneer Museum, which always fascinated me. And so uh, that's what we did. And when we, we got there, as soon as it opened on Sunday, and this nice gentleman was at the, the front desk, and I said, I told him what I was looking for. I was looking for older fiddlers who played in old styles and knew a lot of tunes. And um, he says, well, I know just the person. And he says, it was Campbell. And he said, you will find him at a, a festival. They're having a festival out in Henderson today, and you will find him there. Now, how often do you find somebody that knows that much? <laughs> and uh, so we said, whoopee, you know, and so off we went to Henderson, about 20 miles away, where there was a little bluegrass festival in progress, a very strange little bluegrass festival, but um, it was in the a site of an old schoolhouse that was kind of falling down, to tell you the truth, but that people were playing in and out outside and inside and um, they were having a good time. So the man who was in charge of the festival ran off to get Mr. Campbell. He was very excited that somebody wanted to interview Mr. Campbell. So Mr. Campbell comes in and he's got that long face and he speaks very slowly and I said to him, as I always do when I start a recording, I get the name of the filler. So I said, you're Everett Campbell aren't you? And he says, no, ma'am. I'm Everest. E-V-E-R-I-S. That's why I look so weak and puny from them hanging that name on me. And from there on, the whole interview was that way. It was just fun, and but so full of good music and um, funny stories. Uh, and when I did my book, I had him kind of in the centerfold, to say the truth, with a big, I did his entire interview because it was so much fun to read. Um, so Mr. Campbell um, was born in 1909, and his main influence was his great-grandmother who lived with them. But um, he had a, a huge family of fitters on, on both sides. Uh, I asked him if, if, if his father had learned to play from his great from his mother, and he said, um, my daddy's daddy were a fiddler, and his people on his mother's side was fiddlers, and I just guess he inherited it. Uh, naturally, his grandmother fiddling all around, you know, he'd be like me. He couldn't help it. And, uh, you know, I, I've been telling you these stories about how fiddlers learned to play, even though they weren't supposed to be touching the fiddle. And so, of course, he had the, the coolest one. He said, um, I will read it. His father didn't want anybody with greasy hands to pick his fiddle up, being the bow had rosin on it. He come in on me one time. I had went in the closet and sneaked his fiddle out and tested it. It was tuned. And I began, and from that time on, I was playing the fiddle. And so I thought it was gone to Orion to the Woodman meeting, and I was in the closet playing up a storm. He come in and opened up the door, and he told me, he says, Now, son, I've heard a lot of people going into the closet to pray, but people don't go into the closet to play the fiddle. Come out here and take a chair and play some. I went out and done what I could, and he said, Go get that fiddle when you want to. It's that, if it's out of tune, come get me. And so he got his father's blessings. He spoke that a lot about so many things in, in a precious way. Um, he played for a lot of dances. And I'm very interested in those. So I asked him, what dances did they do there? Uh, and he said, well, no, ma'am, I don't know a thing in the world. All I know is I came in there with black eyebrows, and whenever I'd come out of there, there'd be so much fiddle rise among my eyebrows until they'd be gray as a possum. And he called the dances brogan rallies. 
uh, when I asked why, he said, the Star Brand Shoe Manufacturing Company just kept my mailbox full of thank you cards because people wore out so many. Back then, they didn't have nothing but a leather sole on the shoe, and people wore out so many shoe soles until they was always going and getting another pair of Star Brand shoes. Uh, they kept my mailbox full of thank you cards. <laughs> There's a little hyperbole there, don't you think? Uh -huh. uh, but he was a great fiddler and he had a, a a very good store of tunes that he learned from his great grandmother and all those other people. So here goes Everest Campbell's Jenny Broke a Wooden Leg, a dancing at the ball. <laughs> Campbell's great-grandmother, and from her we have, through Everest, this wonderful tune called Muddy Road to Texas. <laughs> told us about a fiddler named Henry Lee Hudson who lived in Bassett's Creek, a community between Thomasville and Pine Hill in Clark County. So off we went. To get there, we traveled southwest on State Route 5 and US 43. Before I-65 was built, this was the main route between Birmingham and Mobile. But now the roadside attractions and most of the services um, were gone or hidden underneath a lot of kudzu. On the other side of Thomasville, we, we turned onto a smooth, wide, red dirt road and passed Bassett's Creek Baptist Church, which was built in 1810, before Alabama was a state. And soon we came to the home of Henry Lee Hudson, who greeted us enthusiastically. So Mr. Hudson lived in the heart of the Piney Woods, where the main source of employment revolves around planting and harvesting and milling pine trees. Uh, he worked as a sawyer most of his life, and he's uh, shown here playing at the sawmill days in Fulton, um, which is a lumber mill town. And uh, now when we found him, he was 86 years old, he was very hard of hearing, and he told me he had gotten old in one day when he had a stroke about 10 years before. 
and it was tall and very thin and it kind of looked like a grasshopper plant. It was long elbows and long legs. And um, he, like Dad Hill, he had gone into retirement after um, a short, after playing in his youth and as a young man. And then he had stopped playing for probably about 30 years or 35 years. And um, it was, he probably didn't play as well as he could, but in a way that kept him from playing more modern tunes and improvisations and things that people started putting in their, their um, repertoire later. And he remembered all these tunes he had learned from his father, who was born in 1860, Joseph Hudson. And uh, so he knew these archaic tone, tones and tunes, and he played them in a style that was just what we wanted to hear. So we were really happy to meet Henry Lee Hudson. Henry Lee said that some of his tunes were double old when he and his father played them, and older when he plays them. As I said, his father was born in 1860, and I was thrilled to learn that he was a contemporary of Gus Rose. Now, Gus Rose was a black fiddler. I did not know when I read that in the paper, but the uh, Thomasville paper had uh, two articles about this, the master violinist of Thomasville, and they talk, talked about the balls he played for and how beautifully he played. And, um, so I was excited that um, Mr. Joseph Hudson had played with him and very excited when I found out he was a black fiddler because as I told you, it was kind of rare. I never really met any because they had gone kind of um, underground also at one point. And uh, so uh, I, I was able to find out some things from him about this road, which, which really made me helpful. And another thing about Mr. Hudson uh, is instead of playing all his tunes in standard tuning, he, uh, like a violinist does, he would change his, his tunings uh, to go with whatever key he was playing in. And that's a very old thing to do. Not a lot of people do that unless they're trying to emulate the old people, like we try to do sometimes <laughs> now that we're the old people. Um, he had been an uh, active fiddler as a young man, uh, playing in bands uh, with his five brothers who uh, played guitar and banjo and mandolin with his sisters, uh, who also played guitar. And uh, I think in this photo, the, the woman on the end, I mean, the person on the end may be a woman. She kind of looks like a woman to me, but she's dressing like the rest of the guys. Uh, in this photo, his father, Joseph, is in the center and playing what looks like an enormous violin, but really that's just shadow that makes his violin look big. I think it was a standard size violin. And Henry Lee is sitting at his, his right hand. Oh, one thing he told me is that, like Noah Lacey, before about 1920, especially when his father was playing, they didn't um, have guitars. Nobody played a guitar with this kind of music. Guitars existed, ladies played them, you know, parlor guitars, you know, in their fine homes and all. Uh, but they didn't put this kind of music, uh, they didn't play it on the guitar. In fact, one man from Clark County told me that his father played fiddle on one end of the porch and his mother played guitar on the other end and they had totally different repertoires and never put them together. Um, so he told me that one tune that we're gonna play, Messenger, uh, his, to double up on the sound, his father and his uncle would play uh, two parts, one playing a high part and one playing a low rhythmic part, which made it sound a lot louder and they needed that, you know, for people to dance with them. Well, you may notice if you pay attention to such things that now I have a different banjo in my hand. That's because the banjo, when you change keys, old time style, when you change keys, you change tuning. And rather than sit here and tune and take up a whole uh, program time with tuning, I just chose to get a different instrument that was already tuned. So this is the Kid D, and uh, it's Henry Lee Hudson's version of Messenger, which I think is a really old tune, and uh, it's in two parts. Yeah.
And it's about a racehorse, which why not, maybe why he played it so He played it real fast. And so we think Jim needs to. Ready? <laughs> I've changed it and it's um, tuned A, E, A, C sharp. It's an A chord, all three notes on the A chord uh, on the fiddle, which is not always the case when you retune. And I retuned this fiddle and then pull out another one like George pulled out of Andrew. Yeah. Uh, here we go with the Lost Child. One, two, three. Thank <laughs> you. 
old-time fiddle revival of the 60s and 70s is now deep into its second, maybe even third generation. And so many of our friends, our contemporaries in old-time music have children that are playing and universally they're all playing better than we did. And many like our friends Charlie and Stephanie here learned our tunes from us and uh, now they play them with their friends. Uh, young people who learn them from recordings and really care about such things, they know uh, that these are Alabama tunes and they maybe even remember the name of the fiddler they came from. But if they were passed on in jam sessions, it's really likely that nobody has a clue. They just think it's a cool tune and they play it. Um, but either way, I think the fiddlers who shared their tunes with us would be really thrilled to know that they're still being played today. I hope you enjoyed our program, and now let's just have some questions, okay? And thank you. Mrs. and Mrs. Carlton, thank you. Mr. and Mrs. Carlton, thank you so much for that wonderful program. You're welcome. I can't see you, but... We can't start the video. <laughs> There we go. Okay. There we are. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Uh, let's see if we have any questions. Um, Joyce and Jim, thank you for a great program. I'm enjoying this so much. Thank you for sharing the stories and music. We are loving this. Um, so I want to ask if you could move a little bit closer. So I just wanted to let you all know that we had to uh, pre-record this. So. Uh, that's why we couldn't make adjustments uh, while we were actually um, putting this out. One thing uh, I want to say is, if you all want to, you can definitely book a Rhodes Scholar once it's safe for us all to join again. If you go to Alabama Humanities Foundation, go to our webpage, uh, under the Programs tab, click on Road Scholar, and you can have Mr. and Mrs. Coughlin come out to your organization and speak and um, actually do this live. So thank you all so much for doing an amazing job. And let's see, someone has their hand raised. One second for a question. Keep your hand raised. Let's see. Okay, questions. Who made your fiddle? Oh, good question. I wonder if somebody <laughs> knew about this. This uh... I actually just have required this fiddle recently. It was made in 1965 by a man on Sand Mountain who was a member of, the, I don't know if you remember in the show, we talked about a band in Albertville that recorded on the radio for many years. He was one of that family and they had several fiddle makers in that family. So I feel very fortunate to have acquired one of his fiddles. It was actually made for his um, granddaughter who's still alive and she's the one who sold it to him recently. And Jim's loving that. His thing. name is Adis Johnson. That was, Adis was his nickname. His, uh, otherwise it was LH. Mm -hmm. I, I can't remember what the L stood for. Maybe Joyce knows. It might have been one of his last fiddles too because he was, you know, I think he was born in the early I 1900s. I think he was in the peak of it. Yeah, or maybe in the late 1800s. And so he, um, which Jim's really loving that fiddle, and he's only had it a, maybe a month, and he's still bringing things out of it. You know. All right. So let's see. One here's a question. Um, thank you. Have you played at Pepper Place? Yeah, we were scheduled to play at Pepper Place already, and of course um, they're doing drive-through now. It didn't didn't work for us, you know, to play, but we love to play at Pepper Place. We usually try to do it with our band, the Red Mountain Yellowhammers. We we try to do it two or three times a, a summer. So hopefully we'll get back to it. Are there some standard tunes common to all of these fiddlers? Yes, there. Definitely are, and we had, we, you know, we were interested in the unique personal family tunes, but we sat through a lot of, you know, Soldier's Joys, and they were really into Red Apple Rag, and, yeah, well, I mean, is that yeah, what it's called? Right. And uh, Faded Love, and um, yeah, they played the Forky Deer. There definitely are probably a body of um, 
50 or 60 tunes that, that everybody knows. And I think a lot of them were popularized in the 1920s, though they're really old, by the Skillet Lickers. It was a band from Atlanta, Georgia. And uh, all, a lot of them told me that as soon as they would have a record at or somebody would buy a record in their community, um, they would go home and learn the tunes that were on it. So there were a lot of uh, commonalities between the repertoires. Uh, Henry Lee Hudson played a standard tune called Porky Deer, but he had a, a, a totally different take on that tune, which was really yeah. interesting. Yeah, we learned some archaic versions of that one and also um, um, 8th of January. Some yeah. just really, you can tell when you listen to them that they're older versions of those tunes. Okay. Um, can you talk a little about the women fiddlers you found? I think that was from Susie Thompson. Great woman fiddler. Uh, okay, the only one I was able to interview and record was named uh, Pearl Duncan Morgan. And I knew about her because in Alabama, we have a, a very famous old time fiddler that just about anybody who's listening would know. His name was Charlie Stripling. And uh, he used to win every contest he entered and, and he just kind of made a career. He needed money and he was out for uh, the top prize. And so he won just about every contest he entered, but Pearl Duncan Morgan beat him a couple of times. And mm -hmm. I found out that she was still alive and I went and interviewed her and she played so much like him. So many people in his part of the country, which was around, uh, Fayette County and Pickens County and Lamar County, um, they, they play like him. Nobody played quite as well because he really worked at it. Um, but um, she played a lot like him. It was almost like hearing him play. But of course she was older and a little out of practice. So, you know, when it's tight, um, but she was, she was cool and she was gutsy. And, and I asked her why more women didn't play fiddles. And she said, well, you, you had to have a family to support you, you know, keep your kids while you, you went away. And also a lot of women didn't, um, it was unseemly to get up in front of the public. I don't know if you know that a lot of churches wouldn't let women do anything in the church. And, and uh, you know, they were just supposed to stay home and make life good for their husbands and children, I think. And so there weren't that many, but every, in the old papers, newspapers, and some of the fiddlers I met, that they talked about their mothers being really good fiddlers. And um, any kind of, you get into any kind of series of uh, fiddlers conventions, and there'll be one or two women that won a number of them. In Atlanta, there were two women that were real good. We had in Alabama, two women from around Huntsville that were always uh, winning contests, and, and, but they were always presented kind of as a novelty. And guess what? We had some women, you know, because <laughs> it'd be like maybe 40 men and two women, you know, so it was kind of unusual. So I'm, I'm glad I, I got at least to meet one of them. Are the recordings and photos you created during your research and travels going to be deposited in an archives, or are they already? I'm working on that. Um, yeah, that's what I'm doing. I retired uh, 10 years ago, and that was going to be the thing I did was get ready to give those to an archives, and we haven't done it. <laughs> and so uh, after this show, <laughs> we're going to start working on it all summer. You know, we're trying to digitize them. They're on long tapes, and uh, you know, it's just too hard to find the tune you're looking for. So we're trying to digitize them and name everything. And it's real long and tedious, but we, during these hot days of the summer, we're going to stay right. inside and do that. All right, we've been using the spring weather to be outside working, mm -hmm. but well, it's getting hot now. I see. In the Huntsville area, where can we hear old time music? I'm aware of the Tennessee Valley Old Time Fiddlers Convention in Athens. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that's the main one. I don't know uh, much. They have uh, the dances, and our friend Jim Holland, uh, who's a really good old-time musician, he plays for dances, uh, and Karen Falkowski, some, yeah. some people that we play with a lot around here, Ed Baggett. Uh, they play for dances. I'm not sure they, they perform out a lot. I think Jim does with a lot of different kind of bands. 
So I'm sorry, maybe some coffee houses or something like that. But when when you can dance again, there's the North Alabama country, dance, country dance or traditional dance uh, uh, association that meets uh, um, on um, first and third Saturday nights, and mm -hmm. you'll hear old time music there. Right. But definitely the Tennessee Valley Old Time Fiddlers Convention. They have some really good contestants that come from all over and uh, you'll hear some really good old time music and old time singing there too. So thank you so much. Did you find any old fiddlers in the Bruton Wing area? I think I did um, around Bruton. They definitely were there. I think the person I went to see turned out to be more uh, of a bluegrass fiddler and played newer tunes. So I, I don't think I did much with it, but I'm, I'm sure that they had good fiddlers and every, every place did as, as far as I can tell. It's a matter of finding them. Yeah, it's a matter of finding them. All right. My young daughters and I heard you and loved it. And then Jim and Joyce, where can we go to hear old fiddlers who might still be playing? What about community dances? I think you've already addressed that one. Is well, there anything else you want to add? <laughs> <laughs> we're the old people. So if you want to, uh, uh, and we play for dances. We play for Pepper Place. We um, sometimes get invited, you know, by historical associations and all. And as Melanie said, you know, we give these talks for the Alabama Humanities Foundation where we go and play. I don't know. There's not a real consistent way to figure out where we're going to be because we don't have, um, we're not good with social media so much, getting that word out where we're going to play. But uh, I think that we're it as far as the old people anyway. <laughs> people like that. You do you plan to attend the Athens Fillers Convention this year if they have it? Oh, we, we went every year. We've been going every year since probably 75 or something. And maybe even earlier than that. I don't know if any earlier than that. Last year, I had to miss it, but Jim went. But it kind of got rained out. So I don't, at this point, I don't know what how they're going to handle it. Um, but we'll go if they have it for sure. Yeah, yeah. it can be done safely. You know, yeah. there's all this problem with the pandemic. So I you know, think so. it can be done safely as long as people wear masks and distance themselves to right. listen to the music. I think it could happen. Well, maybe they'll do it uh, a virtual yeah. one. Okay, so this is Howdy from Florida, Lloyd Baldwin. Do yeah, you remember Lloyd. Rik <laughs> Do yeah. you remember Rikers Dusty Miller? Been trying to recall it. Oh, I remember Ed Riker really well. He was the uh, blind fiddler, and uh, he had arthritis so bad when we went to see him, he couldn't play, but he gave us a tape, and I, we must have given it to Lloyd Baldwin, too. Uh, and we haven't gone back and learned it, but that's part of um, what we're going to be doing as we uh, work on archiving this stuff is digging out the ones we still want to learn. There are... Uh, the tapes that we, when we got the recorder on loan from the Smithsonian, those uh -huh. recordings are available somewhere, aren't they? Aren't they in the... Uh, okay, we kind of have two sets of recordings. One, okay, I did all this work for about six years using a, a little cheap inboard microphone tape recorder. It was real good at recording its own sound. Yeah, that's, Bill Foster says that. It, it, they record their own motor real well. And um, so we have those. And then I, after I got my book ready to send to the press, um, I decided, you know, I could do a, a record album. That was albums then. And uh, so I got the library, I asked the Library of Congress if I could borrow equipment. And so they sent me professional recording equipment. And we went back and recorded as many as we could. But some of them, like uh, Everest Campbell, he had decided he was too old to play and he wouldn't play for us, which it just killed us, you know. But um, uh, anyway, what, what, was, what was the question? Some of those <laughs> tapes are, are, oh, yeah. are in the archives. Yeah, so the, the, early, the, the latter tapes from the library with a good equipment, they're in the archives, but they're not organized well right. and that is what we want to do is to organize they're all out of order and, Plus, and, and so we're going to work on that yeah, and there's some uh, recordings from city stages and stuff yeah some of the fiddlers uh 
um, played at City Stages, our big festival we had downtown, and, and they're on there. Like you could hear, hear Ralph Whited and um, more of the blues guys and the, the gospel than fiddlers. But uh, anyway, that they're, they're archived. I mean, they're archived, but they will be archived better when we finish doing right. all this. So where can people purchase your books? Okay. Um, whenever we go give talks, I have a stash of them, but I couldn't figure out how to, I don't want to be selling them from my house and everything. So I think you would just have to go to the University of Alabama Press catalog and order it. You know, they, they print them out as soon as you order it. And so it's still in print. There's things I would change about it now because that, that book came out in 1989 and I know a lot more now than I did then, but it's still a fun, fun book to read. Okay. Will you tell us the name of your band again, please? Uh, we're in a band uh, called the Red Mountain Yellow Hammers. It had another name for about 35 years, but um, we needed to change it. <laughs> and I won't say why, but we need to change our name. And so now we're the Red Mountain Yellow Hammers. And we, I'm also, at, Jim and I are in a, a band that uh, also plays, we have a, a, a uh, a uh, hammer dulcimer player and we play it kind of a different kind of music too you know and so i think we're supposed to play at pepper place sometime and uh that's that band's called the sparklers but we um haven't made any recordings the uh red mountain yellow hammers have made uh, four recordings and we've been in a band for mm, 35 years or something like that same people mm -hmm. Jan and Janet Wallace here. Thank you for sponsoring uh, Alabama Humanities Foundation and Jim and Joyce enjoyed listening. Let's see, we have another question. Um, tell, tell a story about visiting Arlen Moon. You all had so many great adventures. Uh, Arlen Moon. Well, Arlen Moon, I just remember going and, and just enjoying talking to him. Arlen Moon was a fiddle maker and a fiddler and he and his family, he's one who really passed it on to his family. All his family still plays. He's long deceased. All these men are, are, are deceased, you know. But uh, mainly I remember that uh, Joey Brackner, the state folklorist, would tell me what wonderful meals he ate there. So I went expecting wonderful meals, but I found out that none of the wives would cook for a woman. They would just cook for these single men that showed up. <laughs> I remember that, but but we had a lot of fun with the moons and got to see their the red barn where they had um, uh, shows a, a lot and um, and and I was just really happy that I think they're all the way to his uh, great grandchild's place today. You know, so I'm happy that they kept going. Does everyone learn this style of music in the jam sessions that you mentioned, or does anyone put it down in written music style? You want to talk about that? Oh, yeah. Um, I've learned almost everything either in person or from recordings of these that we made or with other people have made of these fiddlers, and I've learned them by ear, which is the standard way to learn this music. However, um, Lots of several modern fiddlers transcribe tunes too as they learn them, and I've taken to doing that. Um, it's a useful technique. It kind of helps check your ear. So mm -hmm. I've got um, transcriptions of some of these. I'm not sure which one. I'd have to go look. Mm -hmm. And other people might have them too. But it's um, writing them down is useful, but you need the recording to go with it. It's not. You cannot get all the nuances when you just record it on a sheet of paper. There's something that I think people call festival style. And it's it's when you play tunes that you learned in jam sessions without ever going back to the source. And so you got this neat hot version that you learned from your friends. But if you went back and listened to the kind of the original recording of it, it would be quite different. And I'm there's nothing wrong with a uh, festival style, but if you were wanting to present it like we do uh, as something from these uh, fiddlers, you know, we would go back to recordings we made and, and try to listen real carefully and make sure we presented them as they had been played. And, you know, there's 
it, it's a never ending quest for me. <laughs> because I, every time I go back and listen, I find things that I missed. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you, it's, yeah, it's embarrassing. Oh, let's see how he played it. <laughs> we even recorded something wrong and then <coughs> later discovered that it was wrong. And, uh, now I've been trying to make it up forever. Probably not only. Well, it, it was not the Money Road to Texas. We played it uh, today. Uh, that if you learn it, learn it from that, learn that version <laughs> instead of <laughs> the one we recorded. Are there any characteristics of Alabama fiddling that are different from other places? I, I don't think so. I, <clears throat> there are characteristics that are different from, say, Northeast Alabama to West Alabama and to Southwest. Alabama to Southeast Alabama, but if you go to Southeast Alabama and go into West Georgia, they're going to be near the same. I think it's more of a regional defined by geographic boundaries than by state boundaries, mm -hmm. per se. But even now that doesn't exist because of recordings and everything that uh, some people only play things, say, from the Round Peak, North Carolina uh, area, and uh, so even if they're in Alabama, they play in that style because they really liked it and they learned it from recordings. But when I went back, uh, the re old recordings I could get, there definitely were uh, regional styles. Like on Sand Mountain, they played more the the Georgia style, more like uh, the skillet liquors. You know, it was just, that's the way they played in that area. Down where Mr. Campbell lived, I think it, there was more of a, a Scottish uh, Celtic kind of influence to it, and they played things like Haste to the Weddings and and uh, the Campbells are coming. The Campbells are coming, and the Irish Washerwoman. They played that kind of stuff, and, and the coolest to me was in West Alabama on the Mississippi border. Well, like Mr. Um, Henry Lee Hudson lived in that area, but up north where Charlie Stripling and all these guys lived. Um, they had a real nice kind of rolling, rich tones to their playing. That's very different. If there's any characteristics today, uh, when people think of Alabama fiddling, I think they think of it as sweet, you know, mm -hmm. kind of sweet. And I, I think we sort of play that way. And uh, we're highly influenced by a fiddler named James Bryan, who's the sweetest of fiddler, right. fiddlers, you know. So that might be, huh. and that first tune we played, uh, Climbing the Golden Stairs, is kind of, Sweet, sweet tune, yeah, marvelous lesson. Yeah, oh. so I guess if you're going to use a word, that would be. And I, some people don't think would think that's that's not how they want to play. But right, that's, Messen maybe that's Messen not how we want to play. On the other term, <laughs> on the other hand, messenger is not. Yeah, so muddy road to Texas. Mm -hmm. um, so there's, you know, you can't really apply that either. Mm -hmm. I think that's an overgeneralization. Right. Okay, we have three more questions. Okay. And you may have already answered this one, but I'll still ask. How can I hear the difference between Alabama fiddling and let's say Tennessee or other states? You you really can't. I mean, yeah. if you go up to Sand Mountain and you go to the Chattanooga area, which is right there next to it, they'll all sound, or at least the older fiddlers, all have a similar sound. So but that sound was very different from Charlie Stripling in West Alabama. Mm -hmm. So you, I don't know if you can identify by state. I, feel, I still think you have to go by region, yeah. geographical regions. I think like, you know, West Virginia has like four distinct areas and things like that of fiddling. So you have to do it a little smaller and it's kind of defined by mountains and rivers. Straight rivers. And, you know, like it could, uh, the, the music, these particular fiddlers all got together and played, but they didn't ever go over there. And, and so it's... It's like yeah. between where Charlie Strippen lived in, say, Birmingham, you have to cross kind of a ridges and, a and streams and to get to Birmingham. But to go to Mississippi was easy. They were right next to Mississippi. They shopped in Meridian. You know, mm -hmm. They didn't shop in Birmingham. So mm -hmm. the cultural exchange was... With a geographical thing uh -huh. and not so much state uh -huh. boundaries. And they play much more like Mississippi. Mississippi's got a great fiddling style. I guess if you, we always think of Mississippi fiddling as a special, unique kind of fiddling. Uh, and that is one where we apply a state name to it. But Tennessee would have a lot of different kinds. And, right. and that, the Alabama fiddlers up in North Alabama played like the Tennessee fiddlers. And a lot of them moved to Tennessee. A lot of them moved to Chattanooga and stuff and played. And so... 
there's a big mixture of styles there. Do you have any CDs available? Uh, well, the CD, if you were, if you liked our presentation today, the CD you should get is Possum Up a Gum Stump. And that has the, the fiddlers themselves rather than us. And uh, so you can hear what they play like. And it's got, we, we got recordings of fiddlers who were born in the 1800s and had been long gone when we started this work. But we put those on there. And there's some real interesting guys like D. Dix Hollis has some great tunes. And, uh, and then we also put those recordings we made from the Library of Congress. And you can get that from the Alabama Folklife Association on their website. You go to alabamafolklife.org and go to the shop area and it's just $10. And so I would recommend that. Then we have um, four, as I said, we actually, we have six uh, recordings. We, we were in a band called Flying Jenny, named after that the contraption that uh, Noah Lacey told us about. And uh, I'm really proud of that music because it was uh, all based on these guys who had taught us fiddles. So if you can find uh, that, uh, we have a few of those uh, and you just have to uh, message me or something on Facebook uh, and I could get you those. But the others by the Red Mountain, we, we just call them Red Mountain Band, uh, they're on Amazon and you, you can get those. Okay. Do you have music for Rubber Dolly? We we did hear people play Rubber Dolly. I'm not sure that we've got a recording of anyone or not. We'd have to go dig through our archives, which is our we summer used to play it. <laughs> we used to play it. Uh, Jim's father, he didn't play fiddle, but his um, great Jim's great uncles played. And mm -hmm. so Jim's father, actually, he would say, um, Play all my hair. I mean, he really knew the tunes, and we were. We well, I remember Howard Colvin uh -huh. played it. Played it really right, well, yeah. and so did Lotus Sticky, but Lotus was from Indiana. Mm -hmm. So, I don't know that we have recordings of Robert Dolly or not. I'd have mm -hmm. to dig through our tapes. <laughs> yeah, we've never recorded it. All right. I think you may have already addressed this last question, but just in case, are there any CDs available through the Field Recordings Collective? Oh, uh, yeah, there's one of Ralph Whited. We didn't play his tunes for some reason. We loved Ralph Whited. He was from Aniana, Alabama. And Bob White of Huntsville did a radio show with him. And uh, so we've got that one. I, that may be the only Alabama fiddler, but he was an, a neat guy and neat, neat fiddler. Yeah, Someday I want to do a whole program on Ralph Whited. Right. But, um, so that is on there. I, I someday would like to do another one that has uh, maybe a collection of the, the fiddlers who didn't make it on any of our CDs that uh, I could put them on, on that, you know, that from the, they're willing to go with recordings that are not the top quality. They understand that we all had cheap cassette players, you know, so I would like, I usually did never put those out, but uh, now I'm just loving so many of them that I would like to do that sometime. So the Field Recorders Collective has this Ralph White CD. Now the, the characteristic of Ralph was that he didn't tend so much to play tunes by other people. He played his own tunes, tunes that he composed himself. So it's a little different than he was, but he was really good. And that has to be a really good CD. Mm -hmm. That radio show was wonderful. He didn't play many of his own tunes. He had a big repertoire. He didn't play many of his own tunes on that show. Okay. But that's what we like to play. We play his, he had one called Turkey Foot and Willow Creek and Sam Hill. Sam Hill. We love to play all those by him. So it'd be fun to use those sometime. Well, Mr. and Mrs. Colton, I just want to say thank you again for doing an amazing job. You guys were wonderful. And um, don't forget that if you want to book them in the future, uh, probably sometime after August, maybe. Um, hopefully, we'll all be back to uh, a new normal. You well, can, there, um, you have to live in Alabama, though. <laughs> so, oh, yes. And then yes. The, I, was, I don't see any, hardly any Alabama people out here. They're all from <laughs> all over the place. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> but anyway, well, you did a wonderful job. Uh, I, I mean, we couldn't have done this without her just calming us down and saying, don't worry, you can do this. And also, <laughs> Really appreciate it. Interesting project. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You guys, A plus. 
All right, well, I'm going to end our recording. Thank you all for coming. Uh, I am purchasing 10 books, and we're going to give away 10 books to um, 10 people who registered and stayed until the end. And some of you may be wondering, where are my books from other virtual world scholars? We are in the process of putting those in the mail. I am a, a, a program director of one, <laughs> well, like five programs. So uh, next week, I have some help coming into the office. And so uh, we will uh, be getting out all those things that we've purchased and that we owe you. So thank you all again for joining us. See you next month for the next Virtual Royal Scholars Program. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>